So, sehr geehrte Frau Klüger, sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, ganz herzlichen Dank, dass Sie Präsident nach dieser Gedenkstunde sich noch die Zeit Thank nehmen, mit den Jugendlichen der Jugendbegegnung des Bundestages zu sprechen. Ich möchte I would like to briefly introduce the group to you. There are 75 members of the group, aged between 17 and 24, and they are involved in the subject of the past and anti-racism, either within the context of ex-concentration camps or in other contexts. They come from 11 countries, Germany and its neighboring countries, from the USA as well. And over the past six days, they've been looking at the subject of forced labor. We visited Mittelbau Dora concentration camp, which is the symbol, really, of forced labor. And here in Berlin, we visited the center in Schöneweide, where we concentrated on civilian forced labor. And we also had discussions here at the Bundestag with regard to the subject of compensation for forced laborers. And we also talked about modern forms of forced labor, modern forms of slavery in all countries across the world, but including here in Europe. And yesterday, we also had a conversation with three contemporary witnesses who had been forced laborers themselves. And the participants have now been preparing themselves, and they'd like to ask you some questions. But perhaps, perhaps both of you would like to um, say a few words before that. Yes, I would like to welcome you all very warmly once again. I did so before during the plenary debate. I wanted to give you really a very warm welcome. Wichtig, dass es nicht nur I think it's important to have this kind of official, formal way of addressing Germany's past. At the same time, it's equally important for this kind of culture of remembrance does not become just simply something which is a matter of routine in Germany. This is something which we've decided on voluntarily, and it should be something where people in this country get involved, particularly young people should get involved. They should be interested in this part of history and the issues that the history raises and the responsibility, of course, which is created by this past. So every year, it's very very encouraging for me to see these groups of young people and to see that not only do we find sufficient numbers of participants to take part in this um, youth encounter. In actual fact, usually there are too many applicants, and my impression is that there are still as many people wanted to take part as was in the past. Of course, these events are further and further back in the past as time goes on, and at some point there will be no contemporary witnesses alive anymore. So people might be worried that there would be no interest in these events of the past at some point. But every year I become more and more sure that there is no need to worry about this and that this really is one part of the DNA, if you like, the historic DNA of Germany as a country. And this kind of event makes that clear. And this is a great pleasure that that is the case. So it's good that you are interested not only in this issue, of course, but mainly in this issue and that you've been looking at it in such detail over the last few days, and I hope that this interest is maintained in the future. I'm curious to hear your questions, and I will do my best to answer those questions, and uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. So that was the starting point. Who would like to put the first question? Um, Frau Klüger, Sie haben ja, wie in Ihrem Ms. Werk Klüger, um, in your work, you've looked at aspects of German culture of remembrance and criticized them. You've talked about these mere phrases that are used, and you've criticized this culture very much. To what extent do you think that events of this kind can make an active contribution to fighting neo-Nazism and anti-Semitism in Europe, amongst other things? Do you mean kind of um, concentration insgesamt, camp memorial um, centers? No, I mean the remembrance culture, this kind of trip that we've been involved in. 
um, the idea of people looking um, at events of the past in order to fight against anti-Semitism yeah, and racism say, in the future. Well, first of all, I would say that when you see these plaques which have been put up for remembrance or when you go along to these remembrance centers, then it's something you should do for yourselves, for your own, in your own interest, if you like, rather than thinking about the effects on other people. It is really worth going along. It's the same thing if you go to a funeral. You go along for your own benefit, if you like, uh, in your own interest, to try and come to terms with the fact that you have lost a loved one. And you don't do it because it's in the interest of the deceased person. And I think the same thing applies with regard to these memorial centers. And in my autobiography, which has been mentioned several times, I was fairly critical about these memorial centers, these ex-concentration camps. But I did write that book 20 years ago. And I have to say that um, in the meantime, so much has changed. And the same applies to these memorial centers, these ex-concentration camps in Germany. So very often people organize them in a very clever and intelligent way and I think that they can have an educational benefit and they probably do because of the way that they are organized. But what I am slightly concerned about is one thing with regard to these memorial centers. It's important to look to yourself and to ask yourself questions about why you are going there. If you think, oh, well, I'll just cry some bitter tears about what happened and that makes me a good person in some kind of way. And that takes you further away from being able to look at things in an objective fashion, I think, to, from really being able to look at what happened. And it stops you, I think, from drawing the lessons which need to be drawn for the future if you're just kind of navel-gazing, if you like. And I think the concentration on the Nazi period can also promote radicalism. If you look at what exactly happened at the time, what the fascists did, what the SS did, when you look back at this time, there can be a trend towards violence. And I think probably many of us have this tendency towards violence, towards aggression. And people, of course, might try and copy uh, these deeds which the Nazis were involved in. So I think this is something we need to be careful about. Thank you very much for your answer, Ms. Kluger. And perhaps in the next questions you can briefly say, give your names and say where you come from and then we can carry on. Yes, it's easier if we know who people are. Ja, das Problem mit dem Aufstehen besteht darin, dass man das But Mikrofon dann nicht hört. Aber wir wollen nicht Menschen stehen, weil sonst werden wir nicht hören. Du wirst nicht direkt in deine Mikrofone sprechen. Aber du könntest vielleicht kurz aufstehen und dann ins Mikrofon sprechen. Und dann sitzen und deinen Namen geben. Wer möchte als nächstes sprechen? Like ja, hallo, Frau Klüger. Äh, hallo, die Frau Klüger. Die nächste Frage würde auch an Sie gehen. Äh, ich meine nächste Frage geht an Sie. Mein Name ist Seven. Ich bin 21 Jahre alt. 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 Ich bin political way of dealing with them, the fact that countries are closing their borders, that Europe is taking action in this way. How do you feel when you hear about this? I can't really say that much about this issue. I've not been following events that closely. I live in America and I'm very interested in the moment at the primaries which are taking place in the US at the moment. I think what is clear is that there needs to be some kind of agreement reached. 
So all the EU member states need to reach some kind of agreement and need to make a contribution to solving this very difficult um, problem. And the refugees need to be divided up in some way between the different countries where capacities exist, where they can live and when they can maybe make progress in their own lives. And then, of course, there's the Syria conflict. Hopefully, this conflict will be able to be resolved at some point. Hopefully, there will be some kind of ceasefire or something of that sort. And after Davos, that seems to be a difficult thing to achieve. But I think I'm the wrong person, really, to answer this. I'm probably the wrong person to talk to you about European policymaking or to quickly give you my opinion. But I think Germany is being an example, setting an example in this context. That seems clear to me. And there are many people across the world, I think, who see it in that way. Yeah. Uh. Hello. Uh. Yeah, 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 my name is Corinna. I come from the US and I'm from the Aktion Sunnezeichen organization and I've been involved in the center in Brandenburg um, with regard to the subject of euthanasia. I would like to put a question to Ms. Kluger and also to President Lammert. Perhaps this is just adding to the last question in a way. But I would like to hear your opinion on the culture of remembrance. What role should the culture of remembrance play in policy making, the policies towards refugees today, and the mood that we are seeing here in Germany at the moment? Would you like to answer? Well, perhaps I could start. When if you look at what are known as the Western democracies, and if you see them as being some kind of virtual block, then there are many things which unite those countries, many things they have in common. Indeed, I can't think of many really important differences between Germany and other countries like the United Kingdom, France, Spain, Portugal, Poland, or indeed the US or Canada. But there's one exception to that and that is the culture of remembrance. And this is just not, not just my subjective view, a view which I express myself as a German, and I think the impressive book which was written by the head of the British Museum Neil McGregor showed this. He published a book last year which was connected with this big exhibition which took place in London about Germany. And there's an English and a German version of this. He, of course, is British. And he says if there is one difference, one major difference between Germany and the other countries, then it is the fact that the Germans have this very, very different way of dealing with their history, a very different different way um, to the way in which the British or French deal with their history. It's obvious why Germany has this different way of dealing with its history, because our history is, of course, a different history. But he also draws attention to a further thing, which he puts in a fairly simplistic fashion. He says that almost all states in the world tend to be selective in dealing with their history and like to recall the great achievements, the successfully won wars, which have taken place at some point during history. And the Germanys, the Germans are the only ones who recall these terrible things which took place in their history. And indeed, they have these huge monuments in Berlin, the capital city. I was very interested to read this. 
It wasn't something that made me feel self-satisfied because I could straight away explain why I don't see that there are the same needs amongst Brit British people, French people or Polish people. We have this need to deal with our history and we make sure that we do indeed address our history. As to the question of what this, what role this is going to play with regard to refugees, I think one can only speculate here, really. I can't really give you a general answer on behalf of everybody. What I can say, though, is that there are a number of important figures, including the Chancellor, for whom this culture of remembrance does play a role. Of course, this is not the only thing which motivates them. Of course, that would not be sufficient if we look at the issues which need to be tackled. Aber auch naiven Verständnis, it would be a little bit naive, perhaps, to deal with the refugee situation in a, by trying to kind of compensate for past errors which have been made in history. I think that would be slightly naive. But, of course, we do have this awareness of the special German history, and I do think that that plays a role for many people. Perhaps I can give you a personal example. I don't need to refer to other people, perhaps. Of course, the refugee situation is the main topic at the moment in German, German, in Germany, in the public arena, in the media, etc. At the beginning of the year, I have a lot of New Year receptions to visit, and there is one thing that I point out there. These things which were, would perhaps not be told in this way in France or in Spain ja, or in Poland. Ist dass ich immer wieder sage, wir haben jetzt einen Haufen Probleme. One thing I repeat gar, again and again is that we do have considerable problems to tackle because there is no European answer to the problem at the moment. People are either trying to escape from the problem or to find their own solutions just for their own countries. Aber das mal vor die Klammer genommen, vor allen praktischen Problemen, die dabei sind. So yes, of course there are all these practical problems which need to be resolved and as of course there are different ideas about what kind of controls and checks we need on the borders, etc., etc. Nevertheless, one point is important. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of people leaving their home countries because they feel that there is a risk to their life and limb, or because they see no future in their own countries. And to them, Germany is the most attractive place in which they want to live and to shape their future. I think this is a surprising thing in a way. If you look at German history, this is a huge compliment. It's a huge compliment that people are giving to Germany as a state. So, of course, people talk about the practical problems which we face on a day-to-day -day basis. But I believe we should see this as a challenge. We should see this as a statement. And, of course, there are these day-to-day -day problems, but nevertheless, we should remember the bigger picture. And, of course, there are some people who are against refugees coming to Germany. There are some people even attacking um, the refugee centres. But, at the same time, I, myself and other people point to what this means for Germany. Germany is a country which carried out an organized persecution of people, which led to a mass exodus of people, and other people who fled from Germany were only able to survive because they were able to escape Germany and because they were able to seek refuge in other countries. So this is Germany's history, and if Germany as a country is not prepared to expect this, uh, accept this special historical responsibility, then what does this make us as a country? 
in Spain, in and Frankreich, the same Poland, thing you could say Deutschland. in Spain or in France or in Poland, but you couldn't expect the same reaction in those countries. So I do think that this culture of remembrance is not just a kind of ritual which takes place every year. It does really have an impact at political level. You talked about France and Spain and Italy as other countries, but there are other countries which should remember more about their past. Turkey, for example, because of the mass murder which was carried out against the Armenians, these countries should address their past as well. It would do them good as countries, I think. I think they could learn something from Germany's example, in fact. And with regard to the USA, I can say that there is a certain, there is a very lively debate at the moment in the US. We are finally addressing the consequences of slavery. This took until the 1960s. We are finally addressing this episode in our history properly. We're doing it with citizens, with intellectuals. And there are plenty of people getting involved, black people from within society even people who are not particularly well educated. Black people can say what needs to take place. And it's a very interesting debate which is taking place at the moment. So you have to watch these debates and you have to do what your conscience tells you to do and help where you can help, I think. But of course, Germany is a more extreme example. But if you look at the repression of other people, if you take it from this angle, if you look at it from the angle of repression of minorities, for example, then Germany is certainly not the only country which carried out uh, terrible acts during um, that century, during the 20th century. There are many other countries which need to address their pasts. And I am surprised by Germany. From childhood, I've been kind of taught, if you like, to mistrust Germany. And things have changed so much in Germany. And now I no longer mistrust Germany, I can say. Maybe you can never completely get rid of this distrust towards a country like Germany, but I think things have changed. And you should look at what is happening and you should let that be fed into your own opinions. And it's clear when you come from the USA because there are these debates going on which take place. There are these flags which are being floor, fla, flown and those are often right-wing radical groups. And in Germany, you only see flags when soccer matches are taking place. And I think that's quite a good thing. Yeah, um, um, yeah, mein Name ist Christian Philipp. Ich bin Freiwilliger in der Gedenkstätte Buchenwald. Und meine Frage an Sie, Buchenwald Memorial Center. And my question to you, Mr. President, to you, Ms. Klüger, relates to what you just said, actually. Um, how do you perceive the current development for Jews living in Germany today, where Jews actually think about emigrating again? How do you see their situation and what kind of opportunities do you see for the government to act or to intervene? Well, um, you, you mean that the Jews are, some Jews are afraid of rising anti-Semitism, that they want to emigrate uh, from countries like France and Germany? Well, well I, I don't think it's that many, really. Um, I think it's an idea that many people might ponder with, but very few people actually do it. Um, uh, like the French say, we don't want to live without you, so please don't emigrate. Apart from the fact that uh, life in Israel is by no means less dangerous than life would be in France. I, I hope it's a passing wave, really. I, and, uh, it might be the consequence of a spectacular but individual uh, attacks. Is, yeah? Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Yeah, also. 
genügende Antwort im Sinne von well, abschließende, zufriedenstellende habe ich für um, mich nicht. I weil do not have a satisfying answer for me, at least not a conclusive answer, because of course. Um, I, I think that every Jew who does not feel comfortable here in Germany is one case too many. On the other hand, I see that there is a kind of well meaning, maybe a little bit naive idea of a world without anti-Semitism, which does not exist. I think for the reasons mentioned, anti-Semitism uh, is under much stronger taboos here in Germany than in other, any other European countries. And it is not by accident that the figures we see from France are significantly higher than the figures for Germany. Um, not just concerns raised, but actual emigration figures. We have a strong growth here in Jewish communities here in Germany. We have uh, many synagogues that are being erected. So the presence of Jewish life here in Germany has increased significantly, which of course could encourage uh, those that never learn. Uh, you know, those anti-Semites uh, that never learn, because uh, the more inconspicuous this coexistence with other religions and cultures is, uh, the less uh, these people feel challenged. And uh, the more conspicuous it, it is, the stronger this reflex to act against it. So, um, yes, unfortunately, uh, there is some anti-Semitism here in Germany, but there is no second country. If you look at the state, the public institutions, public life in general, there is no other state who takes as clear and unambiguous a position than this one, regardless of uh, any majorities and any of the parliaments. It's just a fact. And uh, let me tell you this. We look at the parliam parliamentary uh, representation of such groups, we've been quite lucky, quite lucky, more so than other parliaments in other European countries. Well, uh, we will never be able to get rid of anti-Semitism. That, that is not going to happen. But um, I think it's a society can live with hostility, but you can not live with a situation where anti-Semitism is based on legal grounds. And uh, as far as I know, Basically, every European country had anti-Semitic laws uh, that Jews were not allowed to do this or that, were not allowed to live here or there. The only exception, the only Western exception, is the United States. And of course, there is a lot of anti-Semitism as well. Um, but, but it was never legally stipulated. Well, but the United States are, is a relatively young country, a relatively young state, and uh, uh, was actually born as a democratic state, whereas most of the European countries have uh, centuries before they came democracies. Um, no, I'm not saying the United States is, is a tol tolerant country. Um, the, the, uh, disregard of other people manifested itself in slavery and uh, in the unequal treatment of uh, black citizens and other minorities in the United States. But we were speaking about anti-Semitism specifically, and there was never any legally based anti-Semitism. And uh, there was one exception during the Civil War. One of the generals who became a president and was Ulysses Grant he tried uh, to really uh, displace the Jews from one of the states that he conquered, and the, the president, Abraham Lincoln, 
um, got wind of that and he said, no, that's not possible, we don't do that, and within two weeks the whole issue was off the table. Um, I'm just saying the Jews are well integrated in the United States, not because there, are, there wouldn't be anti, any anti-Semites, but they have always had equal rights from the very beginning. And this can, of course, be an example for others as to how to deal with uh, people of different faith, belief, or whatever. Guten Tag. Ich heiße Alexandra. Ich komme aus Russland. My name is Alexandra. I'm from und Russia. Gesagt, ist auch heute ein Thema. And uh, forced labor is fragen, still a very topical issue. So my question is, what kind of measures uh, did Germany introduce in order to avoid modern forms of forced labor? And are those measures sufficient? And do you need anything else? And if so, what other measures do you need? Well, if we, if we think that forced labor is labor that is involuntary labor, then there is no legal basis for this in our country. So if the legal situation is clear, then we have to uh, look at possible cases of uh, covert or overt forced labor, compulsory labor, and uh, if this is the case, how does the state respond, or how do the authorities respond? So if you have any specific examples, that would be helpful, because um, following your generic statement, I do not see any legal gaps, or do not see any um, legitimization of forced labor. Okay, maybe I can come in here. We had, uh, we spoke with uh, representatives from the German Institute of Human Rights, uh, which was founded with the purpose to ob observe forced labor. And uh, she said the difference uh, to forced labor in uh, during Nazi times is that there is no legal grounds for forced labor, but it's it takes uh, more place on a private level and uh, when it came to Germany it was mainly about human trafficking and prostitution, forced prostitution and the question is uh, what can the state do to intervene more strongly and also how can you avoid human trafficking with, uh, with connection to the labor market. Yeah, well, actually, you hear that, uh, that uh, also voluntary prostitution quite often uh, is converted into forced prostitution. It's usually young girls uh, who are trafficked into forced prostitution and uh, don't find a way out. I don't, I don't know if this is the case for Germany, but prostitution is, is a very, very... Difficult issue. And the, another question is, of course, what's the, uh, what's the, what's the, the benefit when you look at forced labor or sweatshops in other countries where products are being produced that are sold cheaply here because uh, people in other places are actually forced to work and uh, the force can also mean that they don't get enough money and thus they are forced to work 16 hours and more. So the, the, those, those are really questions that relate to that. Um, there are organizations that deal with human rights professionally, but if you walk through this world with open eyes, then of course you will see that there is not just uh, general prostitution, if you will, but also forced prostitution, which of course is not subject to any legal protection, but uh, wherever it, uh, it can be identified, it is, of course, uh, action is taken, of course, against it. And uh, there's another issue that deals with uh, uh, refugees and uh, open borders and displacement. I don't know how many times uh, the German Bundestag dealt with the uh, legal framework for prostitution in general, 
and also how to combat uh, criminal offenses in this sector. So without uh, having the figures here, I believe that if we look at the s crime statistics, the big share of forced uh, prostitution is uh, imported crime, which of course is related to the social conditions in countries like Romania, Bulgaria and others. Another problem we wouldn't have if there were no open borders in Europe and uh, if there were no easy import, if you will, of uh, that kind of business models. So, yes, this, this is basically the same as before. The problem does exist, but wherever we uh, recognize the problem, uh, the problem, we combat it consistently, at least in Germany. I hope in other countries uh, as well. But uh, here in Germany there is a great sensitivity, not just for historic reasons, but uh, there is great, great sensitivity when we think of prostitution, forced prostitution, because here in Germany we definitely have a very strong influence of the women's movement, uh, who has said this is an issue that uh, affects this part of society, this group of society, exclusively, and uh, it is important for us that it that it is uh, in the public's awareness. So I'm sure there is um, documentation available from uh, the Parliament's uh, minutes, uh, from other documents that would give you can, could give you an idea of the uh, of the figures. Um, which I don't have with me right now. Well, in the, in the United States, the individual states decide whether prostitution is legal or not. And uh, if you look at uh, Nevada, uh, where it is legal in the state, uh, but is illegal in the city of Las Vegas, so you go outside the city and it becomes legal. So there is a lot of, um, uh, a lot of movement, if you will, going on. Um, but it works in Nevada, uh, be because uh, prostitution is legal and you see less forced prostitution than in uh, other areas. My name is Timo, I'm from St. Petersburg. I'm here for the organization of the German-Russian exchange. I wanted to speak about compensation programs. And could you say anything about the reasons for uh, putting a time limit to the compensation program and what was the determining factor for the uh, for the time that the program actually ran, as a question to the president. And uh, Ms. Kluger, what is your idea of the compensation program in general? Well, what should I say? I'm very neurotic and I never really asked for compensation. I did not want to accept anything from the Germans and how at all would they be able to compensate me for the death of my family. I regretted my decision. It was not a good decision, but I never did it. So um, I'm, I'm really not involved in, in, in this issue. Um, uh, if they were to offer me today, I would probably accept it. But and I think for, for many others as well, it's a very difficult decision. You know, it's, it's, it's like an internal battle that you do. If you accept money from someone else, you forgive them to a certain extent. But um, I, I, I can only speak about my own uh, psychological reasons, and uh, based on those, I cannot really comment on, on, on this program and how others see it. But uh, many people actually manage to get a new start uh, because of the compensation they received. 
So it, it was a very valuable uh, contribu contrib contribution. Um, if you listen to Germans, well-meaning Germans, but also in the uh, in, in the speeches here in Parliament. Germans are proud of, uh, of actually trying to do something, and they said that they did as much as they, as they could. And uh, although Mr. Lama uh, made a certain qualification to that, uh, as we heard today, um, so that we that we always remember it can only be a limited form of compensation. And uh, of course, when you compensate, you must never forget that this can never compensate the death of innocent people, but it is still something you can do and it is something you should do. Um, this is, this is uh, how I understand the uh, perpetrator's uh, standpoint, and uh, I, I don't know how many people share this view. I'm sure there's many people out there who think, well, they, they don't deserve it anyway, and s s so much time has passed, and why, why don't we keep the money here? But um, like I said, I was I was one of those who uh, had this, this psychological dilemma, and I just couldn't find any other answer for myself. Well, I definitely say that we that we do not do enough, and we cannot do enough. That's the dilemma. So you can always find arguments for whether you think what we do is right or whether you think it's not right. And when we opened the exhibition this morning, I said that for a number of reasons, the issue of forced laborers um, has really entered the public's awareness relatively late for, I'm sure, a number of reasons and explanations, which is astounding because if you look at the numbers, it was the largest group of people affected, which, however, never presented itself as a group of victims, uh, unlike, of course, uh, the millions of Jews uh, that, that were killed, uh, the, the, the Roma and Sinti that were killed, and all the others that were killed. When you think about how to deal with this issue, how to deal with compensation, you encounter a number of difficult, practical and fundamental questions. One key issue, one very complicated issue for us was the question whether um, a compensation system or a claim to compensation um, which we established in the year 2000 in the Bundestag, whether such a claim can be financed with public money, like, we, like other compensation schemes. And uh, we thought this would not be the right answer in the case of forced labor, because companies had an economic benefit from the forced laborers. So in a society which takes this issue seriously, and again, what does remembrance culture mean in practical terms, not just as, a, as an official gesture, but what does it mean in practical terms? And in practical terms, it entails, of course, um, the fact that uh, those companies should also bear some responsibility. But to convert this into practical terms was very complicated because many large companies who made a huge benefit from that no longer existed at all or um, had taken on a new legal structure or had been divested into many individual com companies where the uh, shareholders now sit in the US or in Canada or in other countries. I'm sure you get the picture and I'm sure you understand how complex this whole issue is. And then you had many cases where the situation was okay, but almost none of them was, of course, willing to say, yeah, okay, let's, let's do it. And, uh, 
you know, and then you had some companies that were willing to come forward, but many did not. So this took a lot of time, and with a lot of effort, we managed to establish this foundation, where the funds, 50% of the funds come from public funds, and the rest comes from private industry. The other question was, who should be who is the target group and uh, of course again you have arguments for all sorts of regulations you could say that there can be a compensation claim only for a person who was a forced laborer and not for any dependents who now file the claim. Again, there are arguments in favor of that, but there are also arguments, of course, against that. So uh, it would be hard for me to say, of course, family members should be beneficiaries too. But the question is for how long, for example, that's just one question. Uh, no, I'm, I don't, I'm not aware of any detailed uh, regulations. I'm sure that back then we said, okay, this will apply from here till then, and after that the claim expires. Well, maybe maybe you, you, you can look at the United States again. And, uh, there, for a long time, uh, the de demands were made that the dependents of uh, former slaves should be entitled to compensation. It has always been rejected, but the voices become louder and louder that it is necessary, it is correct, and uh, actually it is the right thing to do. If you, uh, uh, if you look at the writer Coates, uh, Af African American uh, writer Coates, he is uh, actually one of the strongest arguer in favor for such compensation, and the arguments are quite plausible, and I'm sure this issue will be on the table for. Uh, for quite a while. It's, 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 it's just, an, just an example that Germany is not the only country uh, having to deal with this issue. Yes, so we've got quite a few people who want to ask a question now. My name is Moritz. I come from Nuremberg, and I'm here with the Coordination Center for German-Israeli Youth Exchange. I have another question with regard to the culture of remembrance. You talked about the individual level, but what about the remembrance culture in Germany as a whole? Do you think it is an honest culture? Do you think it's kind of about being proud of Germany as a country, uh, which perhaps we should criticize. So I'd be interested to know whether you maybe agree with this kind of idea or whether you disagree. So the question is, how honest do you believe this culture of remembrance in Germany is? Is it a kind of way of Germany trying to polish its own image, if you like? I think I've answered this question to a certain extent when we talked about the culture of remembrance at these memorial centers. Of course, sometimes it might not be honest. That's always possible. But perhaps we should start believing that perhaps it is meant honestly. I think in general when we have dealings with other people we have to trust them to a certain extent we have to believe that they're telling the truth otherwise you can't achieve anything if you want to have any kind of interaction within society then you have to just believe that people mean what they are saying that it's true and of course this lie a lie is something terrible because of course it breaks down social cohesion because you can't have any kind of society built up without truth. So yes, to a certain extent, I do believe it is meant uh, honestly, but I'm cautious a little bit. Of course, there is still um, some kind of distrust. 
zu glauben, dass, er, dass Deutschland bei, dass nach allen seinen Bemühungen in den letzten Jahrzehnten nicht ehrlich war. Aber nach allen Bemühungen, die in den letzten Jahrzehnten nicht ehrlich waren, dass wir nicht ehrlich sind. Ich glaube, es wäre falsch, dass alles nur in Ordnung ist. Wir hatten einmal da drüben ein paar Fragen, dann hier und dann hier. Ja, es gibt noch zwei Fragen da drüben, 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 zwei
I say nobody can escape from their own biography. And the same applies to countries. You can't simply say, I don't want to have anything more to do with that episode in my life. This is in the past. I'm not interested in it anymore. And I don't expect anybody else to be interested in this part of my life. What we know from life is that these are things which other people who experience them remember very starkly. They remember exactly what happens. This is something which is etched in their memories very, very strongly. So you cannot get rid of, leave behind your own past. The same applies to people as to countries. So you always carry along your history, your past with you. And this may sometimes mean an advantage for you in the future, but it also may mean a disadvantage. It may be a kind of burden. But, Mr. Lama, you talked about Israel having a kind of almost hysterical need for security, but you do have to bear in mind the threat posed to Israelis, particularly when uh, you have these um, rockets flying around. And to a certain extent, you could say that Jews are nowhere in the world as threatened as they are in Israel. So I would say the need for security is not a hysterical need for security, but a justified need for security. Of course, that's not to say that the policy making carried out by Likud is justified. That's a different question. Yes, over there, there were some questions, perhaps you? My name is Roxana Heidenreich. My name is Roxana Heidenreich. I come from Saarbrücken, from the southwest of Germany. And I'm now doing my European voluntary year in Belgium. This is um, where there are um, <coughs> graves from the First and Second World War. My question is to both of you. What do you think of this new film, Er ist wieder da, he's there again, the film about Hitler reappearing in modern day um, Germany. Do you think this film is a good thing? Uh, what is your opinion of it? I've not seen the film, but I have read the book, I have to say. Well, let me try and give an easy answer to begin with. As to whether this kind of film or book should be allowed to be published, should be allowed to be made. My answer to that is a resounding yes. But as to whether we should have a particularly critical approach, I do think it makes a difference whether it's um, Otto saying these uh, stupid things or whether, it, whether it's Hitler saying these things, even if this is a kind of a false and acted Hitler. I do think that's an important question. I'm not completely sure um, of myself here, but I think that the book has been more successful than the film. I don't get the impression that this film is showing everywhere or has been showing for a long time um, in Germany. That's my impression. So I don't think there's that much interest, to be honest, in this film. And I have no reason to think that the success of the book at the time really had any impact on the right-wing extremist scene in Germany. I, I've never heard anything about that. I don't think that any right-wing extremism was motivated at the time by the book. So I don't know what the motivation of the author was. Probably the author just wanted to make some money and was correct in that, that it would be a good business idea. But as to any political impact of this film, I don't think that there has been any political impact from this book or film. And of course, people outside Germany have been talking about the fact that this book has been published in Germany and has been successful. And people may have been worried about that, but I've not heard anything about people being concerned 
about the, this book being published, but maybe you have a different impression from a Belgian perspective, for example. Well, what I notice in Belgium is that people in Belgium make fun of German history a lot, particularly the history of the Nazi era. They see this as being something humorous, and the film begins with lots of humorous scenes, and that's why it's been fairly successful in Germany. And uh, where I work, um, the team members have said that they want to see this film. So that's why I was interested to know how this film has been received here. Thank you very much for your answer. Perhaps I would like to ask you who's seen this film. Oh yes, quite a few of you. Quite a few. How many of you read the book? Almost as many. Does anybody think that this sort of thing shouldn't be allowed? Or what, did, what was your view of the film? Like Roxana said, I thought it was a very funny film at the beginning, but towards the end I was just really worried about this because there were some quite realistic scenes, some real scenes that were taking place. Um, and these scenes um, were actually used in the film, these real scenes, and then I didn't think it was funny at this point. So I was left feeling, oh, perhaps that is possible. And so I saw it as a kind of warning and admonition, really, about what could happen. I've not seen the film and I've only read a short excerpt from the book, but as far as I can tell, it was really more making fun, if you like, of, of the Nazis in the terms of what uniform they wore, the way they spoke. It wasn't making fun of the victims. So as you say, Mr. Lamad, I don't think this is going to be very interesting for neo-Nazis, for example for example, because in a way they were being made a fun of. It wasn't a film making fun of the victims of National Socialism. Thank you very much. I can say from a French perspective that I thought the film was humorous, but at the end of the film, the lesson is that National Socialism, the Nazi period, could come back in a different guise in the future. That's the lesson to be learned. But we don't have this um, in France. People make fun of the colonial history. Perhaps you could maybe summarize what actually happens at the end of the film, because I haven't seen the film. In the first part, there are lots of jokes about Hitler, and they look at the present day in France, and then at the end there is a dream. Uh, it's a dream of the journalist who is following Hitler. And he believes that National Socialism really could uh, return. Yes, so I think that's it, more or less. Right, okay, I think we've talked about the film for long enough now. And I know there are lots of people who want to ask questions. Let's go over to you. My name is Lieta Berjokova. I come from the Dusseldorf Remembrance Center. And Mr. President, I would like to know to what extent you want to um, be involved with the second and third generation in the future, the second and third generation of um, Nazi victims, so the descendants, if you like, of uh, victims of the National Socialists. Um, I have a few problems with the terminology itself, I have to say. I don't think there are any um, descendant generations of perpetrators. And 
on the, in line with the same logic, I don't think there are any generations of descendants of the victims. But I believe that for future generations, of course, it's part of their biographies, the fact that they've grown up in certain contexts, regardless of whether they come from the perpetrator side or the victim side. So for me, it's about dealing with the impact of these events which took place so long ago. And this is part of what we were talking about when we talked about the culture of remembrance. It's, this is the culture of remembrance. But I don't believe you have this kind of almost legal succession, if you like, that you have these generations of descendants of victims and descendants of perpetrators who themselves have already passed away. I'm not sure. I think it's a very complicated issue, actually because there are descendants of victims and they are very aware of the fact that they are descendants of victims, children, grandchildren, etc. And perhaps they are proud to a certain extent to have this background, which is so significant in historical terms. Or sometimes they are angry at their parents or grandparents that they dealt, dealt with the past in a certain way. And I'm saying this as a mother and a grandmother. Sometimes they do set up groups and they see themselves as being part of the same group as having a shared identity because they have had shared experiences and there are groups of this type in various countries and they meet and talk about what they have in common and what they share is the fact that their parents or grandparents uh, suffered and uh, survived the Nazi period. So this is something which brings them together, I think. And here in the center, there was somebody who wanted to ja, ask a question. Um, hello. My name is Cosmas Tranzer. I'm doing a voluntary social year in the Max Wallen Center in Dachau about the subject of the Nazi period and the uh, memorial centers at ex concentration camps. So today, we may judge the concentration camps, the memorial centers there differently to perhaps 20 years ago. That's something that you've already mentioned. What are your expectations of remembrance work for the future in Germany, not just at these um, memorial centers, but also throughout society? So the question is how these memorial centers can be seen, what role they should play in remembrance work. And yes, do you have any particular expectations of the work of these memorial centers? Yes, for example, or in general maybe for the culture of remembrance in Germany. I've not really thought about this issue, I have to say. So much is dependent on coincidences, I believe. And I think what is happening in the Dachau Center is, is great, really. I have a lot of respect for what is going on there, uh, for the people working there. Any kind of remembrance, keeping memories alive is worthwhile and will have impacts on people. And if remembering becomes institutionalized as it can at these memorial centers and is supported by the state, then it will strengthen people's memories. And Germany is prepared to fund this more than in other places. 
So in other places, people don't want to remember atrocities which have taken place, whereas in Germany, people are prepared to address the past. And these memorial centers are a very good example of not trying to hide these atrocities. And I think if you look at it from that angle, these memorial centers, remembrance centers, should be further encouraged and should be given further support. But of course, things could change very, very quickly in the future. And perhaps there could be a complete turnaround and these centers might even become attractive for right-wing extremists. Perhaps I'm a little bit pessimistic in saying that. I don't know. There's lots of questions over here on the left-hand side. You would like to ask a question? Hello. My name is Taha. I come from the Memorial de la Shoah. I come from Paris. And I have a question for both of you, if that's possible. Um, the book Mein Kampf, Hitler's book Mein Kampf, is going to be on sale again in the near future. I know there was a big discussion in this about Fran in France about this, but what is your view of this? What do you think the impacts might be of this book being able to be sold once again? I think freedom of expression includes even the most unpleasant things being published. And there is a new version of this book. There is a particularly large degree of editorial work which is necessary, but I haven't really looked at the discussion about this editorial work in detail. But I would like to know more about it. But in general, I was against um, the fact that Mein Kampf couldn't be bought on the normal book market, because I believe that you should have an open debate about this kind of ideology. I think that is important. That is what you do in a democracy. Written things, books should not be banned in a democracy. And I also don't believe that any kind of drawings or symbols should be banned. I don't see why you shouldn't be able to show the swastika, for example. Because if these symbols are banned, then people have some kind kind of eagle symbol, which is, of course, meant to symbolize exactly the same thing. So I don't believe that showing swastikas is going to create more Nazis. It's not going to encourage Nazi ideology or neo-Nazi ideology. But even if it were the case, I believe that democracy would simply have to accept this and to do as much as possible to convince people that it's not right. Because I think that banning the written and spoken word was, has always been something which dictators have done, and including the kings. And this is not something which we should repeat in the future. And I think even in Germany, there are too many things which are banned. And there has been this criticism of the new edition of Mein Kampf. And my spontaneous reaction is just leave it alone, don't get involved. But as I say, I'm not familiar with the details. I don't know exactly what has been criticized. Well, I'm not aware of any criticism against it. I just wanted to hear your uh, view. Um, could be that it could lead to a rise in, in the neo Nazis or. Entschuldigung. Also, denken Sie, dass dieses Buch, also das Buch erlauben, also wieder erlaubt. Do you think that if this book is available on the market, 
Do you think that this might lead to a rise the neo-Nazi scene? No, I don't think. It's an old thing. I mean, it's just an old book. But even if it did, even if it did, we would have to face the situation. We would have to deal with it. Because there is a freedom of press, there is a freedom of opinion. Also im Übrigen ist allein die Frage ja wieder ein Beleg dafür, well, the question alone dass scheinbar shows gleiche Sachverhalte ganz unterschiedlich wahrgenommen werden. That the same thing can be interpreted in different context. ways, depending on the context you see it. wahrscheinlich darüber einig, dass es eine leider viel zu große we all agree that there is a far too large number of abominable books, where in 99% you wouldn't even start talking about them or start talking about whether to ban them or not. But, but this one book we said we have to talk about it. That's a very healthy reflex because, again, it forces us to ask ourselves how do we deal with this thing. And uh, basically, I, I fully agree to what Ms. Klüger just said. Noch uh, zwei praktische hinzufügen wollen. Das eine ist ein historisches Argument, das andere ist ein And uh, there's two arguments I would like to add. One is a historic one, and the other one deals with life experience. Let me start with this one. The safest way to uh, make people curious <laughs> in this book is to ban it from publication. Nobody, nobody would read this thing. Uh, unless we say it should not be read at all, then people will come and flock to read it. Um, uh, if, if you uh, if you deny climate change, it's not an offense. But uh, but but if you deny the Holocaust, uh, it is an offense. The second one is not dangerous because the Holocaust is a fact, and the first one is very dangerous. But uh, denying the Holocaust should not be an offense either. It's just a huge bunch of crap, so to speak. And uh, there there are facts. It, 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 it did take place. There's no need for discussion at all. But uh, why should it be a criminal offense? Um, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing to say that Jews just uh, made it up, uh, that, that, that six million of their own people were killed. Um, and uh, everyone is outraged, of course. But uh, on the other hand, I could also say, uh, uh, just laugh in their faces, you know. Uh, but uh, once we have uh, cases in court and once people are uh, sentenced, for something like this, uh, then it, uh, that's when it becomes interesting for people. But, but it's the same thing in France, I think. It's, a, it's also an offense in France. And that's a contradiction of freedom of press. I think this is the only thing that kind of contradicts the freedom of opinion. I think it's even stronger in France than in Germany. That there's stronger punishment, I think, in France. This is leider auch wieder ein gutes Beispiel dafür, wie sehr die Wahrnehmung von Sachverhalten. Well, again, a good example that context matters. The, the, this issue, again, I agree to what Ms. Klüger said. If I really took this position, there would be great probability that tomorrow in the German papers, tomorrow in the international papers, you would read that the uh, president of the Bundestag, Lammert, uh, proposes a lift, a lift uh, of a criminal offense for the denial of the Holocaust. And nobody will be interested whether there, is, uh, whether there are good arguments, uh, uh, that, that, you know, that they, again, there is this link to a certain context. And uh, I, I think we discussed this at great length. Uh, but let me get back to, to the book, to, to Mein Kampf. I'm not aware der zwischen diesen any historian who 
und der politischen Erfolgsgeschichte Hitlers und des Nationalsozialismus ein Kausalzusammenhang draw a link between the book, if you want to call it a book, and the political success story of Adolf Hitler. It's the other way around. The book became a bestseller because Hitler gave it away for free or basically forced people to buy it. It was, uh, you, you were given it when you married, uh, you, had no cho you had no choice to avoid it, basically. You were forced to buy it, and uh, he, uh, of course, uh, made a great deal of money with it. And uh, the, only the, the book started to be sold um, after he had taken office. Not the other way around. And, uh, I think 12 million copies existed. That's a rough estimate. And I'm sure that less than 50,000 of those 12 million were actually read. And uh, I think this is a generous estimate. But on the other hand, I'm sure. If we were to say this book must not be printed here in Germany, I'm sure it will be downloaded on the web in huge volumes. So, we have not so much time left. Okay, we don't have a lot of time left. I have two questions here, and uh, then we move over to the other wing, and uh, that will be it. Um, yeah, hello. Um, ich bin Niklas. My name is Niklas, I'm here for Pax Christi, Catholic Peace Movement. I want to go back to uh, forced labors. Certain groups of victims were not considered uh, when it came to the compensation payments. You mentioned the example of uh, the forced prostitutes in the concentration camps. And uh, so what is your take on this, uh, on, on their situation? Well, like I said in my speech, it is, of course, it, 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 ha it has to do with a traditional notion on gender-related issues, uh, which makes no sense at all and in many, many ways. But uh, it is not unknown that many women are held responsible for men's uh, sexual urge. And uh, different uh, values apply when it comes to men and or, or women. And, uh, Totally, totally different assessments take place, and then the families of, of the prostitutes feel dishonored. Dis, dis, dishonored, they feel ashamed, even uh, even uh, if the family members were uh, were forced to uh, prostitute themselves. You see it in the honorary killings, for example. This, this question of honor, and this is not just restricted to Islam. Uh, we see it in our own history. Uh, if we see on the stage, you, you're laughing, but... No, when you... In the Roman, in the Roman history, when you look at uh, Roman history, for example, yeah, you, you uh, read about women uh, that had been raped and are punished by death. You see it in, in Christ's uh, words and in others. And when you see it on stage, you kind of understand it. Uh, yeah, you understand what's going on, but you're at the same time you say, well, this is uh, this is just history. You know? But in this context, 
There is a certain negligence when it comes to forced prostitutes. Uh, maybe the idea, well, maybe they liked it, maybe they volunteered, etc., etc. But volunteering, that's an interesting issue. It, it, it was said quite often that, uh, that the women volunteered. Every forced laborer volunteered if there was a job that was a little better and you had a better chance to survive or where you were given uh, better food. The, the, the most famous uh, Primo Levi uh, worked outside, out in the open, and uh, he was finished physically, and uh, he was offered a job in the chemical laboratory, and of course he accepted the job. He was a chemist, and this is how he survived. But he did not think about what is better for Germany's enemies, for the Allies. Uh, if, if I dig out there and, and, uh, with my spade or uh, whether I work in the chemical lab, nobody thought about the consequences. And even if the inmates from Ravensbrück volunteered, it was just to have a better chance at survival. That was the only reason, and so the only damage they inflicted was on themselves. Uh, uh, there was no uh, value for the so-called final victory. Um, if you ask me whether there is a blind spot, so to speak, in this competition system, I don't have a definite answer. But when you say hinreichend prüfbare Zwangsarbeit dann denke ich als mit Blick auf die Uhr leider okay. letzte Frage. So, last Adam. question. Ja. Um, hallo, ich heiße Adam Mayer, ich komme aus den USA. Ich bin Adam ein Mayer medizinischer Student an der United Universität States. von Pennsylvania. I am um, a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, was unsere Rolle als die uh, jüngere Generation? I would like to hear something about our role um, as the younger generation um, when we look Beispiel, at the future. Um, jetzt Right now, many of us do our uh, voluntary social year. We work in memorial sites, uh, we work in other places, but uh, the fewer survivors there are, the fewer witnesses there are who actually lived during that time, what should be our role in the future to really uphold the memory? Well, think, reflect, try to understand uh, the perpetrators, try to understand the victims. That's, that's important. It's, I know it's a very general answer, but um, this is an answer I would uh, give to anybody who asks me how you should understand history in a better way. Um, of course, pretty soon nobody will be left who can give a first-hand account. Well, this uh, leads uh, to old people being asked more and more often to speak from those times just like myself, but uh, eventually, like all generations before them uh, and before you, you will learn history from books, uh, from electronic media, um, but you will not learn history directly. But history was never passed on directly. History uh, was always learned uh, through various methods, uh, mainly from written material, from sculptures, from pieces of art. 
an diesen, diese, diese schöne, äh, äh, diese, die, 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 wie, wie heißt sie, die Rias, die, der Rias Chor, der uns die Mursodaten um, vorführte. The, uh, the choir the also das, performed das a song das earlier. Ja, this again is a form of history. Im Grunde brauchen sie die, die, die Überlebenden nicht. Die, die, die haben jetzt alles gesagt und geschrieben. You do, you don't need survivors, also because we said everything that, that is to be said, we wrote everything that is to be written. You don't, you don't need to listen to 90-year-old people to know what happened. Uh, still, I'm glad <laughs> that, that I'm here and I'm glad to be asked. But, but this question is asked again and again. And, of course, das, das Gedächtnis, das, das erinnerte, uh, the, what, what you remember, ich will nicht sagen verfälscht, aber anders remember, gestaltet wird, wenn es aufgenommen kind of, wird. Also sogar jetzt, ist kind wenn ich Ihnen jetzt etwas If I tell you a story from the concentration camp and you try to understand, you try to see it the way it was, then inevitably I have different image in my mind than you do. I cannot convey my image to you because you have a totally different structure, you have different experience, you have a different life and it, it, it will always be like that. The question is how we use the information we had and whether we use it for our own good. Nachdem wir in der ersten Hälfte well, unseres Gesprächs since in the first half mehrfach und hoffentlich hinreichend this discussion festgehalten haben, warum we spoke about the culture of remembrance and why it is important and why it is indispensable. I want to say one thing. Culture of remembrance is not enough. That alone is not enough. Every new generation is, of course, not responsible for the things that happened in the past. But, of course, they are responsible for their own future. And in this respect, when I look at the Western democracies, I see a uh, great deal of inertia. You know, they, people take everything for granted, everything they have, and it is by no means for granted, and just to basically sit on the bleachers safely and uh, just uh, you know, mention their own responsibility from now and then without actually doing anything. So you don't have to join a political party, you don't have to run for office. But let me give, just give you some numbers for Germany. All the political parties in Germany have some 1.3 million members, party members, with a population of 82 million. The German Motor Club has 19 million. Well, this makes you think, doesn't it? And makes you think that the car is more important than Parliament, <laughs> at least to Germans. Period.